Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank Lars and all the organizers for inviting me here. It's my first trip to Oslo. I'm very excited. I've been to Norway one time before, more years ago than I would like to admit. And I'm very happy to be here. I ate a huge quantity of fish for breakfast in my overexcitement to be here. <laughs> also, I would like to say that the, the English title is, as all things cross the, the Atlantic in one direction more than the other, the American title is crossing the Atlantic as well, because the American title has kind of taken over with the amount of publicity that's happened there. So the British version is going to be called How to Bake Pie, and, and it's, it's soon coming out with a, different, with a different cover. I had a very surreal journey because I went to sleep and woke up in Oslo, and my email had gone nuts because there was an article about me in the New York Times yesterday. And so the, the front cover of the science section has, has me and some of these things in it. So that was a kind of not so thing. So I looked, I kind of looked for it in Heathrow and I looked for it in Oslo, but I have to wait till I go back to America to, to see it. But it's much more fun to be here talking to you. So thanks very much for coming. And I'm going to talk about abstract mathematics and my experience of making it, as it were, palatable to people who may have had very bad experiences of it before. And I understand all of that because I think that maths, I'm in Europe now, I should say maths, shouldn't I? <laughs> I've, been, I've been in America for long enough that I've actually taught myself to say math and now I have to concentrate on saying maths. Maths, maths feels really good. Um, that, <laughs> that maths taught, as, as it's taught in school, is often kind of boring, pointless, painful, beside the point, and, and doesn't show people the things that I think are the most beautiful about abstract maths and what the point of it is. And that the point is actually, as you all know, I'm kind of talking to the converted here, but the point is to help us. It's not there to cause people pain. The point of abstraction is to clear out the fluff in order for us to see more clearly what's actually going on. And this is the message that I'm trying to bring people, that it's not there to cause pain, it's actually there to help us. And of course, if you're only, if you're only presented with things you don't care about in the first place, then you won't care about having those things made easier. And so if all the problems that people are given are really dumb, real-life maths problems that don't actually actually have anything to do with real life, then everyone will see, especially young people who see through that kind of stuff immediately, they'll immediately see that we're just talking a load of rubbish. And people, friends of mine who have children that kind of age are often sending me ridiculous homework problems that their children have been given of the form of the form real life problem. You have 81 snakes and 16 of them escape. <laughs> How many do you have left? Or a recent one that someone sent me. There's a tennis tournament, and the first prize is 65,823 pounds. And the second prize is 10,011 pounds. What's the total number of prizes? Because those are clearly very, very sensible. Or the, my favorite one that someone sent me recently. Bill has a pe one meter of string. He uses 30% of it to tie up Tim. He then uses... <laughs> Besides the fact that 30 centimeters isn't really long enough to tie somebody up. <laughs> so instead, I like to show people, rather by analogy, why abstraction is useful. And in fact, abstraction is a process of analogy, because what it does is it says, I'm going to ignore certain parts of this situation, and I'm going to ignore certain parts of this situation, and then miraculously the two situations become the same, and then I can study them both at the same time, which saves me time, which is good because I'm very lazy. And people don't believe me when I say this, but abstract theory often comes from wanting to be lazy, or as I prefer to put it, conserving brain power and conserving energy. Because if you, cons if you do the same thing over and over again, wouldn't you, wouldn't you rather not do it over and over again and just do it once and have that be it forever? And that's what abstract theory is there for. And I think that that, um, that applies to all sorts of aspects of life, not just sciences and programming. And I don't have a huge... I, I'm not very good at programming. I learned how to program in basic when I was four, and I was really good at it for a four-year-old, and I never really got better. <laughs> but I became aware of the function, functional programming community after I put those first Monad videos up on YouTube, and suddenly all these people appeared out of nowhere and said, oh, Monads, that's, that's like what we have in functional programming. And it's very exciting to me that that might be used 
to program actual things in, in the world, because that's not, that's not what I do. The, the work I do is totally abstract, and it, the idea is that it will help other people understand things that they can then do in the world. But I believe very strongly in, in helping other people understand things. There's no point knowing things if you don't help other people know things. There's no point no, having any... Having, there's no, I don't believe that one should have anything without sharing it, and that includes knowledge, money, food, love, all of those things, and knowledge is a really important one of those. And so I'm making it my business to try and help everybody understand these things a bit more, because I think they're very misunderstood. And so I wrote this book because I love maths, and <laughs> I love food. And sadly, most people love food more than they love maths, apart from that one person on Twitter. Is it one of you? Who? <laughs> Who said, who said, oh, the sad thing about being an adult is, is you have to eat? And I was like, what? <laughs> you, you what? <laughs> so apart from that person, <laughs> and, and if you're here, come and have a chat. We can talk through it. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about some of my favorite forms of abstract structure, which may or may not look like they have anything to do with maths. Um, but first I have to, I want to, say to people what I think maths is really, because it's very misunderstood, and most people think it's all about numbers, and it's not. And most people think it's all about getting things right and wrong, and it's not. I like to say it's more like cooking, where when you start and you have to follow a recipe and maybe you're, well, you're worried that it'll go wrong, there's that, but then once you, once you release yourself from that and you decide you're just going to fiddle around in the kitchen with some ingredients and make something, and the only thing that matters is if you like it or not. And okay, so maybe you'll poison yourself, but, but that's okay, you'll probably recover. And, and if, you do, if you do something wrong in maths and you're at school, then someone tells you off and it's scary or something. But in the end, all that matters is whether you've done something that you, you make your own rules up and then you follow them and see what happens. That's what I like to say. And maybe you cause a contradiction, and if you cause a contradiction, then your whole world implodes, and that's okay. You move on to the next world. So uh, I'm going to talk about Bach and juggling and hair and factors of 30 and cake and custard. And I'm going to declare that mathematics is the study of how things work. And it's not just any old study of how things work, it's the study of how logical things work. And it's not just any old study of how logical things work, it's the logical study of how logical things work. And someone tweeted the other day that, that mathematics is important. There was some kind of meme about how we can define this as the study of that, and this is the study of that, and mathematics is, um, uh, um, it's impossible to define. I don't think it is impossible to define. I think I just did it. And I think that's a pretty good definition of math, even if I say so myself. Uh, the trouble with this is that nothing behaves logically. So I don't behave logically. Um, my, you don't behave logically, I'm sure. My, the computer, my computer definitely doesn't behave logically. At least I don't think it, it does. It probably thinks it does, but that's the whole point. I don't think it does, so it doesn't. So in order to study anything logically, we have to ignore all the pesky details that prevent it from behaving logically. And then we move into the idealized world of things rather than the real world of things. And this, I believe, is what the process of abstraction really is. And that's why we move into the abstract world of ideas where things behave the way that we want them to, or at least the way I want them to. And that can be a scary move for, for people if you're not used to it. Because in the real world, you get to touch things, you get to throw things, you can yell at people, you, know, you can hit them and stuff. Whereas in the abstract world, you can't do that. If it doesn't behave, if the logic doesn't do the thing that you want it to do, then, then there's nothing you can do about it. That's just how it works. But then the upside of that is that as if you align yourself with the way logic is supposed to work, then everything behaves the way you want it to. Because everything behaves perfectly logically. And it is the only place where everything behaves perfectly logically. And we can try and apply logic to other areas of life, and it's very frustrating if we try and do that with the expectation that that works. Now, it doesn't mean we shouldn't try, because it's, I think it's always good to try and understand everything else according to logic, but I think this is the fate of many mathematicians who can get really frustrated with the, outside, with the actual world, because nothing behaves the way we want it to. Whereas in the beautiful mathematical world, everything does behave the way that we want it to, as long as we have, you know, as long as all our dreams can come true as long as we have the right dreams, as I say to my students. And so as long as, as long as we think logically, this is the world where everything behaves correctly, and moreover, where any toy we want, we can play with as soon as we've dreamed it up. So it's not like when you're little and you want your Lego set and you have to go, oh, please can I have that? I really want that Lego set. Please get me the fire truck Lego set. Please, please, please. In, in the abstract world, as soon as you've thought of something, you can play with it. It's there. The, the idea and the thing are exactly the same thing. 
And so you create things just by thinking of them. And I wish I could do that for my dinner, but I can't. <laughs> so I'm going to start by talking about this piece of Bach. If there were a piano in the room, I should, I should, someone should invent. They have invented roll-up pianos, actually. I tried one. It was, it was quite nice. It's just it's very short. And so if they, once they've invo invented slightly longer roll-up pianos, I'll carry one of them around with me. But this is one of my favorite pieces of Bach. It's the Prelude in G minor from book two of the, the Preludes and Fugues. And there is a huge quantity of maths in Bach because of the way that the tuning system enabled him to write in every key for, for the first time ever, basically. And so he wrote a Prelude and Fugue in every key. There are 12 keys on the piano. He wrote in major and minor, so that made 24 Preludes and Fugues. Then he got really excited and did it again. So that made 48 Preludes and Fugues. And this is from the second book. And you can almost hear his excitement at being able to write in all these keys that he was unable to write in before. And sometimes I think when he gets to the keys that were the most far away from ones he could previously write in, things become almost simpler because he, he's just enjoying the sheer joy of being in F sharp major for the first time in his life. Whereas the kind of C minor ones are pretty complicated because he's been in C minor before. But F sharp, that's pretty crazy. So he, it's very simple and just happy. It's like, oh my goodness, I'm in F sharp. Anyway, so this piece, this piece is written in polyphony, like many pieces of Bach are. So the four lines of music are independent lines of music that wend their way along by themselves, and each one could be sung by a person. So the first one is at the top there, ba -da -da -da, and then the next one comes in, ba -da -da -da. anyway, when I first studied this piece, it was um, before I even started my PhD. So I, I hadn't studied very many abstract, abstract structures in my life at that point, and I didn't, I didn't understand this piece. I found it very confusing. So I thought, well, I'll draw a picture of what it looks like. And so I drew a picture that came out like this, which depicts where each voice of the music is at any given moment in relation to the others. And so the one that's at the top is the black one that starts up there. And the thing is that it comes down and eventually ends up as the tenor. And the bass sort of wends its way up. It sneaks up the back. And I've drawn it going up the back because it kind of goes quiet and then reappears a little bit higher up. And it ends up as the alto. And the alto ends up as the bass, and the tenor ends up as the soprano. So this would actually be rather difficult to get four people to sing, because mostly people can't sing soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. I have one friend in Chicago who can do that, but that's only one. And it, but the thing is that when I, when I drew this picture, it enabled me to understand the piece better. But moreover, it helped me see why I didn't understand the piece. Because the voices got wound up between each other in a way that was difficult to follow until I drew this diagram out. And once I had drawn it out, it enabled me to follow the lines of music as I was playing it, which I think enables me to play it better. It doesn't mean that anyone listening to the piece can see that picture spontaneously in their head. It also doesn't mean you have to see that picture in order to listen to and enjoy the piece of music. But I believe that it helps me to play it better. And I think this is the point of understanding the abstract structures inside things. That you know, if we strip away the paint and the, the windows and the non-structural walls of this building, we'll get to the structural walls of the building. And then this building will look a lot more like a lot of other buildings. And we don't need to know where the structural walls are in the building in order to use the building. I currently don't know which are the structural walls. I mean, the outside one probably is structural, right? But I don't really know which are the load-bearing walls. And I don't need to, but it's a good thing that somebody does. And I think that's true of all abstract structures. We can go through life. And this is why people do believe that they go through life without needing to know any maths. And so when we throw it in their faces and go, maths is really important, they can just go, well, I don't, I don't do any of those things, and I'm just fine. And the thing is that, yeah, you can be just fine, but wouldn't you like to be better? And that I believe that if you know where the abstract structures are, you can, you can use things better, you can make things better, you can improve them, you can fix them when they go wrong. And this is one example where uh, I... I just feel like it's, it's, also a very, it's also a very beautiful thing all by itself. And sometimes all that matters is that it's a beautiful thing. Now, this is related to juggling. Well, in fact, also it's related. What I was going to say is that then I started my PhD and discovered that in higher dimensional category theory, these are things that are studied in higher dimensional category theory as braids. The braids show the, the coherence of the structure inside some higher dimensional categories. And I didn't know this when I first drew this picture. And then I went back and said, wow, I was studying braids before I was even studying braids. And so mathematics comes up with abstract ways of studying these, where you go, well, it kind of looks like pieces of string. But 
how can I study them as if they were pieces of string without actually waving pieces of string around? Because there are all sorts of situations where it's not practical to wave pieces of string around. For example, what if the pieces of string aren't really string but they're brain cells? And that maybe they think that early diagnosis of Alzheimer's may come from looking at tangled, the tangledness of brain cells that mutate and get tangled the wrong way. And now you can't just stick your fingers in someone's brain and wave their brain cells around to see if the tangle has gone the wrong way around. So an abstract way of studying whether it's tangled up the wrong way is at that point actually useful. Anyway, it's related to juggling. Now, I'm not very good at juggling, except that I said this in a... I was talking to some high school students in in, where was this? It was in Dallas, I think, and one of the professors came up to me and said, well, that's just like what people say about maths, isn't it? And I went, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> because the thing is that I'm really bad at throwing and I'm really bad at catching, and I was pretty sure that meant that I was really terrible at juggling. But after this person called me out on it, I kind of sheepishly went home and I thought, maybe it's just all in my attitude. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not as bad as this as I thought. And I thought, no, I, no, I know I'm terrible at it. So I tried it, and I spontaneously discovered that I could suddenly juggle. I kid you not. <laughs> now, I still don't think that I'm necessarily good enough at it to do it in front of an audience. <laughs> so is there someone here who, would like, who, who can, in fact, juggle in front of an audience? Yay! <laughs> Um, this bottle, the computer. No. <laughs> 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 Woo! <laughs> now, great. What's your name? Uh, Eric. Eric, wonderful. Now, if you wouldn't mind just doing, doing the one where they go through the middle. Through the middle. Yeah, yeah, and walk across the room. So if we, if we now imagine that we have a long exposure camera, and in fact we do all have long exposure cameras because it turns out there's a long exposure camera app that you can get for your phone. And I tried this recently with, a, with some illuminated juggling balls, which I have, and we did it in the dark, and that was even harder. For, so that we attempted with me juggling in the dark with illuminated juggling balls, walking across the room. The pattern that I got was not that great. So then we found someone who could actually do it, and we took this beautiful picture, which will appear somewhere online in, in the coming weeks. But if you could just walk across the room again, and we all imagine that we have a long exposure camera so that these balls are actually tracing a path through the air. That's beautiful. And then what we get is this. Thank you very much. Because... <laughs> woo! If you start with the, the, let's see, the red and the green one, if you start with the red and green one this hand, you throw the green one that way, and then the blue one comes across this way, and then the red one goes across that way, and it makes this, which is the same as the braid in my hair, if we turn it this way up. And the thing about, the thing about braids in our hair, as we all know, is that you only need one band to hold them in. And mathematically, we study that by thinking about whether this strand can actually go anywhere if we pulled it that way. And if the fact is it can't because it's kind of hooked in by this, this part and this part. So we only need one band at the bottom to hold it together. If I take it out, then the whole thing falls apart. Unlike, then I thought, oh, maybe I'll try doing the bark braid in my hair. And this doesn't work at all. Because to hold it together, you would need a band here, a band here, a band here, a band here, and a band here. Because this green one, even if it's held at the, the top and the bottom in place, it's basically just floating around in midair apart from that. And this black one is also floating around in midair. If we, if we take away the black and the green ones, then we can see that the blue and the red one are actually hooked together and wouldn't be able to move. But the black and the green ones are floating around like this. And this is... This is the, this is an extreme abstraction of juggling, and this is an extreme abstraction of a Bach prelude. But if we think about them more abstractly, they've become two examples of the same type of structure, because they're two kinds of braids. And so it's an example of how we've taken two things that are really very different, juggling and a piece of Bach, and we've forgotten enough details that they've somehow become the same thing. So instead of, instead of braiding my hair like that, I made it into a pie. This is my... Bach pie, it's <laughs> banana and chocolate. And this, a picture of another version of this pie that I made recently is on the front cover of the New York Times Science section yesterday. And 
And I did a better one than this one. This is the first one I did, so I've now got better at it. So I'm very pleased with myself. Um, the <laughs> the this is now going to move on to talking about factors of 30, which will be related in surprising ways. Now, factors of 30 are something that we probably do think of as being maths, and we can probably remember what they are, given this is a fairly technical audience. The factors of 30 thus are 1 and 2 and 3 and 5 and 6. 10. It's not a trick question. <laughs> 15. And 30. Woo! That's not very interesting. Um, it's a bunch of numbers written in a straight line, which is just not very interesting. And part of why I'm a higher dimensional category theorist is I think that, that we stuff too many things into one dimension that don't really want to be in one dimension. And we live in a three-dimensional world unfortunately, so we write on two-dimensional pieces of paper in one-dimensional straight lines. And as a result of this, a lot of our maths has got squashed into one-dimensional straight lines, when it really wants to be in more dim dimensions than that. And I would love to have a three-dimensional pen. And, and last Christmas, on one of those lists of things to buy for, for someone who's got everything already, I saw a three-dimensional pen. I got really excited, and I almost just bought it without looking any further. I thought, wait, wait, let's click on this and actually see what it's like. And it was the worst three-dimensional pen I could possibly imagine, even in my wildest imagination, because <laughs> all it was was a kind of thing that fed out pieces of moldable plastic, basically. And the pieces of plastic are only about this long, so you just kind of feed the piece of plastic out, and then it sits there in midair. It's really pathetic. So I didn't buy that, because I'd like one where you can really just draw the things in, in midair. And so the closest I've come to that was this thing I did the other day with a photog photographer in a dark room with some illuminated juggling balls and a torch, and I got a lightsaber, and I got some glow sticks and made all sorts of... And it, was, it, was, it was really funny trying to make... I, I tried to make a climb bottle out of light using a glow stick in a circle. It was really hard to get the ends to meet. <laughs> <laughs> and I started doing things like placing illuminated juggling balls as a kind of coordinate system to try and that was really difficult, but it was very amusing. Um, so things have natural geometry that we squash into straight lines, just like the papers on my desk have a natural geometry. I don't like squashing them into a pile because I've destroyed their natural geometry. That's my excuse. Anyway, so we've lost, we've, we've gone a bit too far here and we can we can look at some of the structure inside this by highlighting which numbers are also factors of each other. And then we can make a kind of family tree where 30 is at the top, 6, 10, and 15 go into 30 without anything in between. And then 5 goes into 10 and 15, and 2 goes into 6 and 10, and 3 goes into 6 and 15, and then 1 is at the bottom, it goes into 2, 3, and 5. And now we see it's the vertices of the cube which is much more interesting, in my opinion, than a bunch of numbers in a straight line. And also, it highlights some symmetry of a cube that we don't usually think about, because we usually think about a cube as sitting flat on a face, and then it has all this kind of vertical and horizontal symmetry, whereas if you hold it, hang it by one of its corners, then it has this rotational symmetry, where these three corners will rotate around if you rotate it this way, and these three corners will rotate around if you rotate it that way. And there's that brain teaser about what happens if you take a cube and you hang it from one vertex and you suspend it halfway into water. Then the question is, what shape does it make on the surface of the water? And the answer is... A hexagon. <laughs> what? <laughs> because, because the water, if it's halfway, will go here. And if you see, it goes below the 6, so it crosses this face, and then above the 3, and then below the 15, and then that way, that way, that way. So it crosses six faces on its way around. Um, this is a representation of a cube cut into two halves. And I can now wrap this up with ribbon like a present, because I feel like it. And an awful lot of maths we just do because we feel like it. And no one ever tells children that. We're just going to do maths now because we feel like it. Although five and six-year-olds do seem to feel like it a lot more. And I've d spent a lot of time helping with five and six-year-olds in school. And their excitement about maths is really cool. I like it. They scream their heads off with excitement when they know they're going to do maths. And they don't. they don't seem to mind so much about whether they're getting it right or not. They just seem to love doing it. And their excitement is, you know, when they want to answer a question, they physically jump up and down, 
You don't get that from undergraduates. <laughs> And it's almost impossible to stop six-year-olds shouting out the answer when they think they know it. And it's almost impossible to get undergraduates to say the answer when they think they know it. So something kind of terrible happens in between the ages of six and when people go to university. And that's something that I would like to address because it's not inherently... Maths isn't inher inherently a fearful subject. The, the, the enthusiasm is there, and then somehow we succeed in killing it. And I think we should stop doing that. And I'm not saying we because it's us specifically, but you know, we humans, we're doing something about that that's not quite right. Anyway, this, I'm going to wrap up with ribbon like this. And my rule, because I get to make the rules up, I can make up any rules I like as long as I follow them. The red one is going to come over from this side on top because it's coming over from the right. So everything that's coming over from the right, I'm going to put on top. And then I need another color, so that's going to be green, and that's coming across from the right, so that's going on top. And I'm going to do the same on this side, and I'm going to have the same colors. So blue is still going to be here, and red is going to be here, and green is going to be here. So that's now going to look like that, because I'm going to follow the, the way the face is joined together. And if we now stare at this and imagine kind of shuffling the red and the blue crossing down here and shuffling this green strand up, we can see that we can turn this crossing into that crossing. And this means that mathematically they count as the same braid because we could just shuffle them around. It means that in a way all we're doing is looking at it from a different angle. Um, and this is, this is something which is called Poincaré duality, which comes up, which I also met while I was doing my PhD, or possibly, yeah, doing, doing my PhD. And um, the, braid, the braid version of it is called the third Reidemeister move, which is something from knot theory. And now knot theory studies ways of seeing if you can transform one knot into the other just by shuffling strings around. And the idea is that there are only three moves that you need to consider. So if you can't get from this knot to this knot in a finite number of these three moves, then it won't be possible. And the three moves are the three Reidemeister moves, because it was Reidemeister who thought of them. And I can never remember which th order they go, but I think the first one is just a loop that you pull straight. And the second one is two strands crossing like that, that you pull apart. And the third one is this, where you pull one strand across a crossing. And this is the, the cube version of it is something from algebra called the Yang-Baxter equation, where you have some algebraic things in this cube face, and it's the same as this other algebraic thing in the cube face. And it turns out that if you use this duality to translate from cubes to braids, it turns into the same thing. And thus, algebra and knot theory meet somewhere in the middle. And then 10 years later, after that, I thought, why don't I try doing this to my bark braid and see what happens? Because you can turn squares into crossings, but you can also go the other way, and you can turn crossings into squares. So if I put a square every place that there is a crossing, I can see what happens. And what happened when I tried this was that it fits together as a cube. And I thought, oh my goodness. And I did that thing that you always do when you first prove something mathematical. I'm not saying this is a mathematical proof of anything, but every time you actually prove a theorem, the first thing you go is, oh my goodness, that's amazing. And the next thing you go is, it's probably wrong. And then, <laughs> and then you go, oh, I expect everyone in the world knows this apart from me. And then you go, oh, maybe it's trivial. <laughs> so, I did, so I did all of these things. I hastily tore up some pieces of paper and stuck them together and made the worst cube that you've ever seen, but it did seem to be correct. So then I thought, maybe it's trivial. Maybe every braid, maybe every braid makes a cube. And then I thought, of course not. It needs six crossings, otherwise it won't. So maybe every braid with six crossings makes a cube. I went through this, this careful mathematical reasoning. Well, maybe every braid with six crossings makes a cube. Well, no, because if you just took two, two strands and crossed them six times, that wouldn't make a cube. So this really, it, this actually does something. It's not just a random coincidence. And then I sent it to a friend of mine who gets really overexcited about this kind of thing, and he said, oh, it definitely shows that Bach was communing with the platonic solids in his composition. <laughs> And uh, I don't think it's necessarily that either. <laughs> also, I don't know that it has any use whatsoever, but it's cool. And some things are just cool, and that's that. And if we didn't do things because we couldn't think of an immediate use, then we wouldn't have practically anything. Because almost all the things, I mean, all of technology that we use now comes from mathematical advances that were done hundreds or even thousands of years ago. The, the people who did them had no clue. I mean, the classic example is number theory from the, the 17th century, which now 
does the whole of cryptography and everything to do with internet. And the, all the whole mathematical basis of computers, there weren't even computers. No one thought of that. And I don't know what it's like in all the countries that you're from, but in the UK, there's this requirement that research has impact within seven years of being done. Seven years. The, the platonic solids, the icosahedron, was the one that had no known example in the world for 2,000 years until the middle of the 20th century when it was discovered that many viruses are icosahedron shaped. But that couldn't be known until, until microscopes were made where we could look at the shapes of viruses. And that took 2,000 years between someone just abstractly dreaming up the shape of an icosahedron because it's cool to when it actually became something. So sometimes the fact that it's cool is the thing that can motivate us, and that's fine. Maths has this odd burden on itself where it's required to be useful. Other things aren't required to be useful. They can just be fun. So I think that maths should be allowed to just be fun, too. I think that everything should be allowed to be fun. Or delicious. <laughs> because cake is delicious, and I love cake, and I'm much more interested in cooking desserts because they don't have any nutritional value, really, whatsoever. <laughs> They're just there to be delicious. Battenberg cake is one of my favorite kinds of cake. It's named after the crest of the Battenbergs or something. But the point is that you have two colors of cake and you don't want the same color of cake to touch itself because that would be terrible. But also, it's a mathematical structure. So we can do a multiplication table of 1 and minus 1. And here we put 1 times 1, which is 1, usually. And here we put 1 times minus 1, which is minus 1. And here we put minus 1 times minus 1, which is 1, so it's a Battenberg cake. And we can try this again with adding even and odd numbers. So if we add an even number to an even number, we get an even number. And if we add an even number and an odd number, we get an odd number. And if we add an odd number and an odd number, we get an even number, so it's a Battenberg cake. And at this point, if I did want to trick you, which I don't, but I do do this to my students sometimes, we, tr we do multiplication of even and odd numbers, and they will cheerfully say, oh, an even number times an even number is an even number. An even number times an odd number is an odd number. An odd number times an odd number is an even number. And I go, really? Are you sure? <laughs> and after, they don't get this in the first week of class, but after a few weeks, they realize that if I say to them, are you sure, that means that they shouldn't be sure. <laughs> So we can also try this with real and imaginary numbers, whether or not you remember what real and imaginary numbers are. Um, imaginary numbers are that thing that happens when they say to you at school, you can't take the square root of a negative number, and then the year after that they go, now we're going to take the square root of a negative number. <laughs> and we don't help ourselves by calling it imaginary. I mean, they are imaginary, but so is everything else. What is real? <laughs> a real number times a real number is a real number, and a real number times an imaginary number, probably given that it's on a page with a Battenberg cake, <laughs> is probably an imaginary number. And now what do you think an imaginary number times an imaginary number is? It's probably a real number, and it, indeed it is a real number, because if you multiply, say, the square root of negative 1 with the square root of negative 1, you get negative 1, and that's a real number again. So this is also a Battenberg cake. This is otherwise known as the cyclic group of order two, but it sounds more delicious as a Battenberg cake. <laughs> we can also do, take this further with some bed flipping, which is why I've given you all a uh, piece of paper with A, B, C, and D on it. Does anyone not have one? Oh, someone at the back. It's always the people at the back. And the, the point here is that we're supposed to flap, up, flap, flip. We're supposed to flip our mattress every season to stop our fat bottom from just squashing one part of the mattress the whole year. And of course, we all write letters on our mattress to show where we are in the mattress flipping season. So this is a real life, this is a real life problem, which has nothing to do with real, my real life, because I never flip my mattress, because I'm much too lazy to do it. It's very difficult. Plus, as someone recently pointed out to me, if you have one of those mattresses with a kind of memory foam top part, then you don't want to flip it over anyway. However, if we were going to do it, we could draw a little multiplication table for it. Now here is where you do zero and zero because you're me and you're lazy. And if you start in the A position and you do nothing and then you do nothing again, then you stay in the A position. You could also rotate it, at which point you get in the B position. You could flip it over. So if you start in the A position and flip it over, then you get in the C position. Or if you start in the A position and you flop, I'm calling this the flop, flopping it over. That's, that's the D position. 
And if you do the thing and then nothing afterwards, it's the same because it doesn't really matter when you do nothing. I like to do it a lot. Um, so we could try rotating and then rotating. So if we rotate and then rotate, then we'll just get back into the A position, which tells us that we can't just rotate every season because we'll never get onto the back. So here, we could try flipping and then flipping over again. And if we flip twice, we get back into the A position, which tells us that we can't just keep flipping every season because we also will just keep coming back to, to A and we'll never get to B, for example. Or we could flop and then flop in which case, we'll also get back into the A position. And so the fact that we have diagonals all the way down, the A all the way down this diagonal, tells us that we can't keep doing the same thing every season if we want to get into every possible position. So we have to combine our acts a little bit. So we can try excitingly doing a rotation and then a flip. So if we do a rotation and then a flip, we get into the D position. And we can try doing a rotation and then a flop. So we start in the A position, do a rotation, and then flop, which gives us a C. And we can, here would be a flip and then a rotation. So we start in A, we do a flip and then a rotation, so we get D. And here we do a flip and then a flop, which is the whole point of doing this. So I get to say flip, flop, which gets us into the B position. And then maybe we start spotting a pattern. And then we think, oh, what do you think goes here? Probably a C, and what do you think goes here? Prob probably a B. And at this point, if you're an experimental scientist, you probably go, well, that's fine. But if you're a mathematician, you go, oh, I should probably back this up with some logic. And so instead of just spotting a pattern and thinking it goes like that, you actually try it out, and you go flop, rotation. So you go flop, rotation. Yeah, that's a C. And this one here was a flop and then a flip. So you do a flop and then a flip. And that really is a B. And then. The crucial question you ask yourself is, how many Battenberg cakes can I see in this picture? <laughs> so there's one with this A, B, A here, which is the same one that's in the bottom right-hand corner. And then there's, the one, there's one with the C's and the D's like this. There's a little one in the middle. But there's the one I really like, which is that the entire thing is one, where each cake of the Battenberg cake was already a Battenberg cake. I call this the iterated Battenberg cake. Here's an iterated Battenberg cake. Here's, here's the letter superimposed so we can see which is which. And I call it the iterated Battenberg cake because I've iterated the process of Battenbergification. And the process <laughs> of Battenbergification is where you take two, two things. It's like painting by numbers. All you have to do is decide what's going to go in spot number one and what's going to go in spot number two. So this could be yellow and pink. It could be chocolate and more chocolate. It could be a bunny and another kind of bunny. Or it could be one kind of Battenberg cake and another kind of Battenberg cake, which is now the iterated Battenberg cake. And mathematicians love iterating things. We're really just like small children who, who like doing things over and over again. And won't, they won't stop. But it's like the fact that if you, once a small child learns how to climb up one step, you can just stick them at the bottom steps, and then they, this kind of the whole world opens up because they realize they can just iterate that one thing and keep going forever until some mean adult takes them off. And, <laughs> But math is like that as well. We like getting ourselves into states where we can, we can feed the answer back into itself, and then we just, poof, we've kept going forever. So this is the iterated Battenberg cake. It's actually a, a piece of group theory. It's the Cayley table of the Klein 4 group. But that maybe doesn't sound as delicious as the iterated Battenberg cake. And I first thought of this when I was trying to teach group theory to my second year undergraduate math students. And they could never remember which was the Klein 4 group and which was the cyclic group of order 4. So I made them this cake, and then they all remembered. Um, the thing about making this iterated cake, by the way, is that it's really difficult to cut the cake into squares that fit together properly. So you end up with just as much cut off cake as cake, and then you make lots of friends. This can also be represented like this, which is an even further abstraction of the Battenberg cake. Because once I've told you that we're doing Battenbergification, the only further information you need is what goes in the one spot and what goes in the two spot. And this, this vertex here is telling me that the process I'm going to use to join the one and the two together is Battenbergification. So I can now put yellow and pink here. 
I could put light brown and dark brown, I could put bunny one and bunny two, or I could put cake one and cake two. But what is cake one? Cake one is already one of those. So I can draw cake one like this with a yellow and pink, and I can draw cake two like that with a light brown and a dark brown, but then I might as well put this whole diagram for cake one in the one spot. And I can put this whole diagram for cake two in the two spot. And now this is an extreme abstraction of an iterated Battenberg cake. But it's also an, a mathematical structure which is called a tree in maths because it kind of looks a bit like a tree. And uh, the thing is that normal trees, that is biological trees, tend to start growing from the bottom up and then they branch out like this. Whereas mathematical trees are abstract so we can read them anywhere we want and we can start reading them from the top down. And this now tells us about how we're sticking together these four things at the top. So it's a kind of schematic diagram, but it's a useful, it's a very useful abstraction of a process of sticking things together. And we can stick things together like addition and we can, for example, stick things, three things together if we're only going to stick together two things at a time, we choose which ones to stick together first. So here, we're sticking the left-hand two together first, and then we're sticking together the answer with the right-hand one. For example, we could do four add four, which is usually eight. And then we could stick two onto it afterwards, which makes 10, which if we were being boring and one-dimensional, we would have to write like this with brackets, four add four plus 10 is plus two is 10. And this way around, we're saying stick the four and the two together first, which makes six. And then stick the four together at the end, which makes 10. And in the boring one-dimensional way of writing it out, we use the brackets this way around, four add, four add two equals 10. And then we ask ourselves whether they're the same. And we know they're the same because somebody told us ages ago that addition is associative. So this is the usual associative law for addition, which we kind of forget about, because actually, they don't tell us this at school, but the, the, the reason that the associative law is there is precisely so that we can forget about what order we add things up in. It's, but something is really going on here. These are not actually the same thing. So the answer is the same, but they're not the same process. And uh, if you're a small child and you're adding things up, then these two processes can be really different. It's like the fact that commutativity is kind of baffling when children start adding up in their heads. And if you give them, if you give them 20 plus 1, then that's fine. But if you give them 1 plus 20, then they'll put 1 in their head and then count on 20 from 1, and then they'll probably make a mistake. Whereas if you give them 20 plus 1, they'll put 20 in their heads and count on 1 to be fine. And they have to learn that that's going to be the same and that one way is much easier than the other. So equations like this equals this are really hiding something. And as I like saying, and this goes back to jo a, a famous John Byers moment, when he said that the only equations that are actually true are the ones that say x equals x. All the other ones are lies, and that's why they're useful. If they really were equalities, they wouldn't be any use at all, because we already know what's equal to everything it itself. Everything's equal to itself. The whole point of an equation is to say that something that isn't really different is somehow the same in a way that's useful to us. That gets hidden. So this is. This is hiding something about different processes. And as, we, as mathematics goes on to study more and more interesting objects, then the difference between those processes becomes more crucial. For example, if we mix egg yolks with sugar, and then we mix it with milk, then we get custard with some heat. However, if we mix sugar and milk together, and then we mix it with egg yolks, we do not get custard. <laughs> these, these things are not equal but they're not equal in, in a way that we might want to study. And it, it depends on what, what we're interested in, right? So if we're, if we're making cake, it actually doesn't matter very much. The, the traditional recipe for cake that I know, anyway, says cream the sugar and the butter together, and then mix in the eggs, and then fold in the flour at the end, and then bake it for some time, and you get cake. Whereas actually, it turns out, especially if you have an electric whisk, you can just kind of chuck everything in a bowl and go, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Um, so this, this diagram depicts the process of uh, moving one little branch of this tree from this side to the other side and seeing what the difference is. So we can try this with all the cake ingredients, and we can try all the different ways of combining them. So this is the usual one, where you first cream the butter and the sugar, then add the eggs, and then the flour. This one says, first of all, mix the butter and the eggs. If you try that, it's kind of disgusting looking. 
Then, then you mix the sugar in. It still looks pretty disgusting. And then once you put the flour in, as long as you beat it hard enough, the flour will sort of sort everything out. I tried this with my students. We brought all the cake ingredients in, and we tried it. And so this one, also, you have to start by mixing butter with eggs, and then you add flour, which is pretty disgusting. And then you add the sugar, and it kind of all works its way out. This way round is quite interesting, because you need two bowls. So in this one, you mix the, the sugar and the butter, but you also separately mix the eggs and the flour, which is pretty disgusting. And then you mix them together. So if you're lazy like me and you don't like washing up, then this one is definitely different because you have to wash an extra bowl. Uh, and this one, you mix the flour and the eggs, which is kind of disgusting, and then the butter and finally the sugar. So all of them turned out more or less the same after a lot of beating. And so it's kind of up to you whether you count them as different or not. In some, uh, in some contexts, they're not different. If, uh, if you, someone else is making the cake, then you probably will never notice which one it came out like. Whereas if you're making it and you don't have an electric whisk, this is definitely the easiest way of doing it. Because, and I think that's why the recipes were, are like that, because if you, they didn't have an electric whisk in those days. Um, the other ones are more or less the same. It depends whether you care that your cake looked like vomit along the way. <laughs> maybe you care, maybe you don't. And what we hide a lot in maths is that it's kind of up to you as the mathematician to decide what you care about in any given situation. And we can decide when things count as the same and when things don't count as the same. And it depends. It's like the fact that if you offer some pieces of chocolate cake to a small child, they will know which piece of chocolate cake is the best one. And if you don't give them that one, they'll cry. Whereas as adults, we kind of come to terms with the fact that they're all more or less the same, and it's OK. And that, uh, that part of becoming an adult is knowing which details to ignore in any given situation. And that's a process of abstraction. And mathematical thinking, to me, is part of the thing that helps us see which things are relevant in a given situation and which things are irrelevant. And the abstraction kind of takes us away from the real situation, but in a way, it gets us to the heart of the situation. Which one is more real than the other? What does real even mean, as I said before? So what is real about this is that, really, we might like some chocolate cake. And if we had chocolate cake, then we would have one more ingredient on this thing. And so we would have another branch of the tree. And then we would have a lot more possible combinations for it. And if you're me, what you do is you think of this one day when you're sitting in a cafe, and you scramble for pieces of paper, and you draw all the trees, and then you stick more pieces of paper together because it didn't fit on your paper. You end up with this giant thing, and then you stick it together. And the thing that you get I've, I, is something that you can cut out and stick together. There's a picture of it on some page in the book that you can maybe not cut out the book page in the book, but I guess um, photocopy it. And someone actually made me a, a 3D printed me one which I think I brought with me. I forgot to dig it out before actually starting this talk, but here it is. It's uh, got a hook on it so that I can hang it on my Christmas tree, which is why it's in the festive color of black. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, think this is, I think this is pretty cool. So it's got six pentagons like that, and it's got three squares because the three squares are different. They say that you do things in a different order, but in separate bowls. And so it kind of doesn't, they don't affect each other. So there are, that's a whole different kind of sameness. And so we quite often study not just when things are equal, but if they're not equal, in what way did they fail to be equal? So just doing things in a different order in different bowls somehow isn't as different as going around this pentagon. And so every time you, every time you add another ingredient, you get another dimension. So if we wanted to make a chocolate cake with walnuts, then we would need something four-dimensional, which is not so easy to do these days. Um, the other thing that's funny about this is that it's not, you can see, if you look at this, it's not completely flat on any side. And that was part of the challenge they had of, of 3D printing it, because if you stick it together, the, some say there's two pentagons that meet in some, some place, okay, here, these two pentagons meet. On that side is a pentagon, and on this side is a square, which means that the pentagons have to be twisted. So it's not something that you can, um, it's not a kind of whatever the word is for something that you can make without twisting it. But someone, <laughs> when I first put this on the internet, as tends to happen when you put things on the internet, someone wrote to me, some dude wrote to me, and said, well, this, this won't work if you make it out of metal. And I said, well, I didn't say I was going to make it out of metal. <laughs> so, so make it out of paper. <laughs> Thanks, though. <laughs> so the, the conclusion, well, it's not really a conclusion, but the reason that 
that, that this is this is it, towards the second half of my book because in the second half I actually start talking about category theory because my whole aim was I wanted to I wanted to talk about what category theory is there for because I've discovered over the years that that I can talk about category theory with non-mathematicians almost more easily than I can with mathematicians who aren't category theorists. And the most difficult ones are the ones who are quite close to category theory but don't want it. And they have a huge resistance, <laughs> huge resistance to it. Whereas people who are not mathematicians at all get the ideas of it. And I think that there are many people who actually need to or want to learn category theory, but nothing previously had told them what it was there for or what the point was. And so there are a lot of people who learn lots of technical category theory from Maclean or something, but never really see what the point is. Whereas the point, I think, is very clear. It's the mathematics of mathematics. And so for me, if mathematics is the logical study of how logical things work, and category theory is the mathematics of mathematics, then category theory is the logical study of the logical study of how logical things work. <laughs> and the reason I like it is because I feel like it's a fixed point of abstraction. With most things, <laughs> when you get more abstract, you move into a different subject. So if you, study, if you study birds, that's one thing. If you think about a new way of studying birds, your new way of studying birds isn't a bird. It's a way of studying birds, so your abstraction has moved you up a level. Whereas in category theory, if you think of a new way of studying category theory, it's going to be another piece of category theory. <laughs> so <laughs> to me, this is the most satisfying place to be because I always wanted the most abstract thing possible. And I couldn't get any, any more abstract than this. And so this is where I found myself. And I hope that I've given you, as it were, a taste of my approach to abstract mathematics. Thank you. Any questions? So uh, I have a question, for, uh, like as an educator, uh, every time I learned something abstract, it came from like a lot of brute force doing the same repetition over and over again, mm -hmm. and then suddenly the patterns and, and abstractions would emerge and I'd have a great intuition. On the other hand, when somebody comes to me and teaches me an abstraction, mm -hmm. I, I have this like impedance mismatch where I'm trying to understand this thing and, uh, and, and I can't because I haven't gone through that routine of, of learning that. So how, how do you teach abstractions to people? Do you like... How do you approach that from like an, as an educator? Do you still try to run people through exercises? Do you, I, I hope you it's understand very, the gist yeah, of my it's question. A very, it's a very interesting question. And for me, one of the reasons it's interesting is because, because different people's minds all work differently. And for me, I never came to, I never really came to abstraction by doing the same thing over and over again. And once I came to, so there's a thing that I call my book, the difference between internal and external motivation. So external motivation is what I think of as where you have something in mind and you, you head towards it. Whereas internal abstraction, internal motivation is where you, you're just inside something and you kind of feel what's happening from inside it. And I'm always an internal type of person. And I have, I have met people who have, be, who have struggled with maths in school because it's mostly taught externally. And actually, what they, they found the direct abstract route made a lot more sense to them. So there was this one little girl I helped in school. She was six. And they kept trying to get her to add things up, like cookies and apples and, and stuff. And she couldn't do that. But she could add numbers up. She just couldn't do the apples and things. So she had to understand the apples via the numbers. And so all of the books they'd given her to help her were hopeless because they were all going through the, the apple thing to try and get her to the numbers. And it's very interesting because it's the same with my art students. Uh, because I now teach at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. They're all art students. They have to, it's a liberal arts course, so they have to take some science. And maths counts as science in an art school. And, <laughs> and uh, they, ca they have a choice, though. But I... I build this maths class as something which is going to be different from all the maths they've done before. It doesn't matter if they failed high school maths. So a lot of them, they're very open-minded and they want to give maths one more chance because they hated maths in high school. They couldn't do it. And because I say that maths is about thinking about things and they're art students. They love thinking about things. And so my approach, instead of going through, okay, we're going to do this problem loads of times and now we're going to solve the general case. They don't like that. They just like thinking about things and, and just seeing structures that emerge from thinking about things. So for them, that's a much better way. So yeah, they like playing with things, but they also love it. They love building shapes. And so if I give them these pentagons and things, they sit together and they fit them together. And the moment when they f succeeded in fitting together the pentagons with the trees on it, they get so excited. It's, it's really fantastic. And 
Um, whereas that pentagon thing is an, it's called a, a sociohedron that usually you don't study unless you're doing a PhD in category theory. So why, why do we hide these things from, from people until they've got to that stage? We make people jump through all these ho hoops before showing them these exciting things. And so um, in short, in long, it depends. <laughs> it depends what kind of person that you're talking to. So sometimes, sometimes people like going through the process of doing things over and over again and seeing for themselves what the pattern is that's going to make it work. And sometimes people like thinking through it and seeing the structure that's there. And the beauty of the structure that emerges will be the thing that convinces them. And so I think one of the problems is that if we try and teach everyone in the same way, then it's hopeless because everybody's different. Um, So, uh, oh. So this is a, sort of in a strange way, sort of like a follow-on to that concept. But um, I'm curious as to like, what is your what is your stock answer for people when they say to you, "I don't like maths." Like, what is your answer? Uh, well, actually. I'm going to just hedge a little bit and say, people have not been saying that to me as much recently. And one of the reasons I wrote this book was because I had discovered that people had stopped saying that as much as, oh, I wish I understood maths a bit more. And so if they say they don't like maths, then I sympathize. But I suggest if they, if they sound in the slightest bit open-minded. So I've got used to trying to tell whether people are open-minded or not. If they say that because they just want to hate me, then I will simply say, well, it was lovely to meet you. Bye. <laughs> But if they sound in the slightest bit open-minded, then I will sympathize and say, but have you, have you seen any maths other than high school maths? Because I hate high school maths too. I hated maths classes all the way through school, all the way. And the reason that I knew, somehow I knew that there was something more wonderful than maths that was really maths, partly because my mother showed me beautiful things that were nothing to do with that. And so I just kind of, I kind of begrudgingly slaughtered my way through maths classes in school and hated many of my maths teachers and was probably a pain in the neck as well. Hopefully not too much, but it really frustrated me, the things that we did in school. And I can see why people would hate it as a result of that. So my first answer is to fully sympathize with that point of view. And then to propose that maths isn't actually like that and see whether people are in any way open to the fact that maths in school isn't really maths. That's kind of school maths. We should give it a different word like ridiculousness or something, <laughs> something non-judgmental like that. So I have one more question. Um, so you looked at the structure of one of the Fugue from Bach, yeah. um, and you found this very specific structure. Yeah. Um, are the, did you also look at the other Fugues? Are they structured similarly, or do they all have their own thing? I did start. So a lot, most of them stay more sensibly. The Fugues tend to stay more sensibly separated out in the voices. Um, a lot of the preludes aren't actually written polyphonically. They're just, they're, some of them are an aria with an accompaniment, for example. I haven't sat down and gone through all of them because I was really worried. It's like starting a good book. I was really worried that I would just disappear from the world for a week and, <laughs> and not emerge again. So next time, I have, next time I have a week without anything to do, then maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that. But yeah, I would, I would like to look at all of them and see what's going on, see if there are any more platonic solids. Maybe there's an icosahedron in there. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, if not, then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.